I hope we get politics just to get it out of the way. <laughs> In my regards to Abigail, I don't think it's on her thing. It's on it. Oh, I'm blind. Literally. Um, not to yellow. <laughs> you don't know. You're not blind to yellow. <laughs> my great grandfather could only see yellow. He could only? see. Yeah, he was like black and white, everything, and then yellow. So yellow is his favorite color. Um, that's where that gene comes from. I'm so trying to that's figure out solid. that world. <laughs> it's a very. Is that what it Coldplay? seems like a weird movie? Drive. What was, I'm not sure. Yeah. Was that what Coldplay the was talking? Are in the same order everywhere. Was that, that what order? That? Yeah. Green is always on the right and on the bottom. Is that what Coldplay was talking about? Yeah. I don't know. What, I don't know this Coldplay song. I don't you don't know, you don't know the is. yellow Coldplay song? I don't listen to Coldplay. I had a roommate who really loved Coldplay, and so I decided I'm not going to listen to that. Anything that gets played a lot, like. I'm not going to do it. Like, uh, I listened to a podcast today that was uh, about Stevie Wonder. And I was like, wow, these songs sound really good. But, like, when I was younger, I was like, ah, people really like Stevie Wonder. So, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. <laughs> Contrarian. Um, to <laughs> and some stuff. Things um, like that. On um, pop people, culture. Yeah, you're... <laughs> people are like, you have to like this? No, I don't. I do not have to. It's Americans ga- America's game. Get out of here, baseball. No one likes you. You're boring. Stop it already. You're too baseball long. Baseball is amazing. That's, I mean,. <laughs> I don't know. I was talking to my children, and like I told them what sports Jeremiah likes: basketball and football. And they go, oh, "Those are boring sports." Those oh. are not the boring sports. Have they watched basketball? They haven't oh. watched basketball. Of course, they haven't because it's because evil. It's not evil. It's a great game. It was invented by a Canadian. The only game I would watch this season is tonight. Uh, it's all downhill after that. It's pretty solid. They eventually feel, realized when they brought it to America, hey, what if we cut the bas- the bottom out of the baskets? It makes it a lot less work. So much easier to get the ball out. <laughs> <laughs> takes the flow to the game we don't need a balcony a to play the game balcony or a ladder just a stick <laughs> gotta get it out um anyway take the hockey sticks no they don't need, need hockey sticks that guy was like i'm tired of playing hockey that's probably how it happened else. he yeah. was like i can't do this anymore i can't even skate he's too tall for he was a he was a national embarrassment um what was his name naismith, naismith. something naismith james i think james probably a james or a john tonight would be the only game Pretty i would watch <laughs> Any any historical figure, <laughs> pretty James high. or John? You James mean. or John? You know, John Jefferson. Um, the, <laughs> his name was Thomas. <laughs> Just pick one of the apostles in Western Western history, and you're probably good to go. Other than Judas, so really the eleven. And Not no a lot of Judas players naming their kids here. Matthias. But Paul, you had so, to substitute Paul. Wow, you're one of those. Okay, <laughs> my gap theorist guy also was a substitute Paul guy. So he was supposed to have been time? the 12th? Yeah. We were like, ah, uh, we, yeah. we were premature. Yeah. We, they jumped the gun. And that seems like that was probably wrong. Because probably not. Probably not. Right? You, who was wrong? Your professor? Yeah. You, yeah, I think he's wrong. <laughs> right? I don't know. It's more like a baker's dozen. Just like uh, in the Old Testament. Half tribe. Half tribe. Half tribe. Um, anyway, that's not what we're here to talk that's about. That's not today. what it is. I mean, it, I can put it up there. That. Did they jump the gun on the apostles? Um, it's a very quick discussion, I think. No. <laughs> no. You're going with, no? If we all go with the, There you go. You got an extra, a little tag on. This is If I Had an Opinion. I'm Jeremiah. That's Nigel and Gordon. We have a wheel. We're going to spin it. Um, talk about third tier issues, uh, issues we can disagree on, that sort of thing. So We really haven't disagreed yet on these third tier. We did. Tiers. We did a little bit on Last creation. time. Yeah. yeah. We stayed in orthodoxy, so that was solid. Which is the goal, is that we won't. <laughs> Become heretics, but can can you be a heretic on third level thing? I think certain it people depends. Certain people <laughs> depends on how far you take it. <laughs> That's probably true. That's probably true. Because uh, sometimes you take the third tier thing, you make it a first tier. I don't know. Or you take the third tier thing that messes up your first tier, right? There you go. I, mm, so there are some. Yeah, if it messes up your Christology or your doctrine of God, right? It's kind of okay. weird. Did you see that guy who was like, "Is this a Trinitarian passage?" Just because they use the word ruach. What are we doing, guys? Um, every inst- that's illegitimate totality transfer, man. Uh, every use Spin of the word the wheel. spirit <laughs> is not Spin the Holy Spirit. The wheel. <laughs> and every use of the word wind in the Old Testament. Oh no, I think we're being attacked by like the. We did it. You nailed it. Politics. Um, oh, like, by a hair, like it was. By a hair, it was we almost. Es- we escaped women in we, ministry by yeah. a hair to get into politics. We'll just record the stuff at council. Um, <laughs> it's right in the hallway. Although we're not in actually discussing it, right? That's what they because they sent out a thing saying we we're discussing it, and then they sent out a thing and said, "Our bad, we're not discussing it." My money. Terry on, we're will discussing be discussing it, it. My with John Stumbo, which you've all already heard, which will be exciting. 
to oh. not be a part of a conversation that was supposed to be. Ooh, we could bring sandwich board signs. Pick it. I wanted to pick it last time. Oh. I don't but know. For wholly different yeah. reasons. Do you think the trees guy will be there? Um, <laughs> can we pick it him with signs Post. made out of trees? <laughs> You're making your editing Post job counsel. really hard. <laughs> we're talking about we're talking about politics. I'm not editing any of that out. That's fine. That was what the email said. I'm being transparent. Transparency is key. That's what I learned from Stargate. Um, <laughs> not from any other thing. No. <laughs> not we're going to be talking experience. about politics. <laughs> we're going to be talking about a Christian view of politics, which is what you wanted to do anyway. Um, this is your own, your own Gordon. Third tier issue. So the main issue here, I think, is that oftentimes politics starts sneaking up into our other tiers. Um, and that, at least in America, we like to... We tend to be around people who are like us, which enforces an idea of uh, the idea of like uh, what is probably true uh, is that there are no Christians who are not Republicans is typically how this would happen in evangelical circles. So therefore, that probable truth for us um, ends up being what we actually believe that there's that this would be an area where a lot of people, even if they wouldn't theoretically believe this. Uh, functionally believe that there are people who, because of their politics, are outside the family of God. And I think that's the main issue with politics, is that yeah. uh, oftentimes it becomes a tribal issue where we say, well, you don't believe what I believe about American politics, and therefore you must not believe what I believe about Jesus, um, which is not... Or, 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 what, or what you believe about Jesus has not yet adequately informed your politics. So... It's either a maturity thing where right. you don't you haven't thoroughly enough understood the the imperatives of the gospel and of scripture, uh, which means that eventually you'll get to that same place that that I am or whoever is like whoever. The, usually the I is the one who thinks mature, and the you is the one we think. Right. Is we never think of ourselves as the immature person. Right. In the scenario, we're like I'm the <laughs> I've got it figured out, and if you yeah. were smarter and more mature, you would agree right. with. And, and we do that in the, even a passive aggressive way, which is like I don't really get into politics, which is another way of saying if you were not into politics the way that I'm not into politics, then we would agree. Right. So. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> So other than that, I think one of the issues, uh, so I think that's the main issue, is that we typically otherize people who are actually part of the body of Christ. One of the ways that this typically happens is actually over racial divides. Um, typically, white Christians vote Republican. Typically, non-white Christians vote Democratic. Um, and so we end up in these weird situations where we're disagreeing with people. There's reasons historically for these things. Um, but um, rather than being like we disagree on politics but can agree on Jesus, we typically go, we disagree on politics, so we must disagree. Or you have you don't know Jesus because that my Jesus would be a Republican and these people are like my Jesus would be a Democrat and there's people who do that on both sides. Yeah, vice versa. It, it yeah. goes both directions because the arguments are more on what would be the character of Christ that's being revealed. And so for the... And I'm new to some of this stuff, but from a conservative standpoint, I would not, wouldn't put myself in the de Democrat or Republican camp because I'm neither. I'm just just barely became an American. But the idea of <laughs> Did it. conservatism, um, typically, that's more of the law and order kind of things. There's rules and regulations. There's there's free market uh, capitalistic economies. Those are usually the conservative side. And then you would that would affiliate with certain elements of the Old Testament and, and Jesus's teachings and and on the other side of it would be the things that a, a more of a liberal Christian would, would would gravitate to which would be the social issues so then it's well but now we're dealing with the compassion and the love and the mercy of Jesus and the thing is that Jesus nailed it perfectly because he literally and scripture says he came with full of grace and truth so he he nailed that perfectly so you're using the word nail in Jesus and I'm getting a <laughs> cross image <laughs> perfect then that works <laughs> that works um so that that i think is is if we are being generous to each other that is a place where you have a common ground is is um tragically i and and i would assume that most christians are not in favor of abortion but when we went through this last election um that was basically one of the talking points was if you vote for biden you are voting for abortion and i'm like okay well i don't think a christian's voting for abortion if a Christian of either party is voting, they believe they're voting to resolve the issue of abortion right. one way or the other. They just disagree on how they're going to do it. Yep. The problem is, who are we lining up with, and are is their agenda the same? So on that particular issue, is 
would the Republican Party be advocating in its platform, I'm not saying in practice, but in its platform to get rid of abortion? Well, the answer was yes. If Would the Liberal Party, with, with the Democrats? No, they would not be advocating for that. So then it's like this very clear, like a very binary issue. But I don't think the Christians are voting for that person for right. that purpose. Because even within abortion, you can go. I'll let you go. And then I'll... Because you raised the point months ago during our pastoral meeting that the Republican Christians have like two issues and then the Democrats Christians have two issues. Like it was like se- se- uh, sexual ethics. Yep. And I forget the other one that the Republicans tend to focus on. Probably abortion. Cause that would make sense. Injustice. Ju- yeah. And then, yeah. then Democrats tend to focus on racial divides and something else. I've, you had four of them. There was two on each side. Oh, you did really Look well. That. Look at that. You left a mark but on Gordon. But needless to say that usually a Christian isn't a one. We are complex, and there's multiple things that go into our voting, multiple things, issues. And usually we should be swearing our allegiance to a king in the kingdom versus a political party that we vote blindly for. Right, because ne- neither one of them really fulfill or satisfy a Christian ethic, like or a full gospel kingdom. No, like, exactly. They're n- they're not advocating for what would be the values of the kingdom. They're they're looking at certain platforms and knowing that they communicate certain ideals that parts of the country are going to gravitate to more or less. So it would be foolish of us to think that there is honesty in in politics, like th- that that even if somebody were to agree that we're going to vote for with certain elements of our, um, of, of what's valuable to us, that they're actually going to do it when they get there. Come on. Like, right. Yeah. I think, <clears throat> cause part of it is that, um, for the most part, at least as part of the CMA, we're not post millennial people. Uh, generally, uh, we might believe that the world you might sh- be on a trajectory. Can't be. Right. You, you lose be. your license. There you go. So, um, <laughs> open letters so a galore, a, a putting our faith in a political person who will then, um, fulfill the agendas of Jesus as if he's going to bring about the kingdom of God here, which technically is like the, the foundation of manifest destiny and how mm-hmm. America was founded. Um, but it isn't a theology we actually ascribe to now. So <laughs> we're, um, by doing that, believing in a faulty eschatology, um, that the world's politics can save me, uh, but the world's politics can't save you. Jesus can save you and nothing else can. Um, and Jesus will bring about a kingdom where there is justice and there is no abortion and there is no racial divide and there is a proper sexual ethic. Like all of it is going <laughs> to yeah. come together in a new kingdom <laughs> rather than, and sometimes we get confused and we try to... And that's part of the argument for not engaging in politics because trust is in Jesus alone. And yeah. honestly, I... Yes, well, I'll pray for the person over me, but it's about working with my church and working with the people around me yeah. to reach the loss of the world. Right. And I think that part is overlooked because if we're looking just at the proposition that's there, is 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 what who who gets elected is supposed to be at least in a democratic country a representation of the majority of the country. So let's say the premise is true. We're not going to get into any of the tampering and all that kind of stuff. But let's just say that that's true. A, a part of what um, I, as a conservative person, would be would be saddened by is that the majority of this country holds to values that I don't think are biblical in those areas. Right. That's that would that would make me sad. Now my my reaction to that is: Do I need to lobby my government harder and further and more? No, I don't think that's the solution. Right. The solution is Jesus. The solution is Jesus. <laughs> so rather than thinking, okay, well, I need to I need to uh, get my my political view more prominent. I need to advocate for greater politics. I need my I need everybody that I know to fo- vote the way that I think they should vote. That's that's only a symptom of a greater problem which the gospel fixes. So if if 70% of Americans truly if the statistics are true that 78 percent of americans identify as christian in some way if they were truly christian in the sense of being dedicated and devoted to christ and and scriptures in in other words they have a personal relationship with jesus christ then our politics would reflect that so i think what we've just discovered is that we are who we've just just demonstrated ourselves and i think sometimes um within politics i would take the view that of Tolstoy in War and Peace, he makes the argument that people always get the leaders they deserve and they want. 
Um, so oftentimes, yeah. both sides will complain about the leader who is in charge. Uh, and Tolstoy would say, even in a democratic uh, situation, that's the leader you wanted. You might not think it was the leader you wanted, and he basically argue it from kind of the idea of like Saul in the Old Testament is the type of lead. They wanted a king like the rest of the nation. That's right. Um, so um, th- that's it. what they, and that's so they got it. And God was like, cool, you can have this. Uh, that's right. See how it works. Uh, and then throughout American history is a little weird because every four years we do a voting thing. Um, so that makes it a little weird. But all of our, where we complain about politicians, they're also the type of politicians we want because both sides will be like, well, I want somebody who stands up to the other side. And I want somebody who oftentimes will be like, I want a bully. I want all these people who aren't like what I think people should be like in the real world or virtuous people. I don't really want a virtuous politician. I want a politician who fights for what I want. Um, And that mindset is (laughs) probably not Christian. Uh, (laughs) It is more uh, a symbol of our kind of American um, rebellion against a kingship that hasn't been here for hundreds of years. Um, But that we want somebody who will knock down the authorities that are already in place. Um, which is a an American ideal is that we will knock down yeah. all these hierarchies that are that are keeping us down, and then we will be free. And so, even though we've set up a government because of that ideal, we still feel that against the government we set up. We set up. Uh, <laughs> we set up a government that we were like, "Whoa, I want to, <laughs> I want to now take this down <laughs> because right. I want to be entirely free." And I think that's another whole other thing we could get into it. And um, all this to say is. Politics in them of themselves aren't evil, and there yeah. are Christians in it who are influencing just like any other profession. Most professions, there's yeah, probably Trump. exceptions. Um, but if God's called you to uh, the classic one is Wilberforce influenced his political thing to change slavery, yeah. right? So there's ways to do, be a politician that are godly and that advance the kingdom. But, yeah. And and that's what we're praying for is is if. What would disappoint me is if we're praying for a superficial Christianity that maintains the veneer that we're living in a Christian society, right. but ultimately we are this whitewashed tomb where we are these you know dead man's bones. Like that's the thing that I would not want us to to be is that okay we've we've achieved making our society more Christian so that the Christians can enjoy the society more, but it hasn't provided an opportunity f- to transform the people who comprise that society with the gospel. So I I know that there's chicken and egg arguments all the way back and forth, but that's where I would say the genesis. And just because you vote for somebody different than me doesn't mean we won't love you. And I think that's the heart of this being a third tier issue. That's right. Right. And so um, I guess... In the last moments, my so I'm a registered independent. Um, people will be upset. I don't know how you that. can do that. That makes uh, no sense. Not not you personally, but the idea of registering as independent. Not. I'm registered as nothing. I was like, I want to register, but I don't want to be part of these parties. So when I do my taxes and like, you want to give anyone? No, I don't want to give anyone money. Um, I think politicians shouldn't be able to raise money for their campaigns. But um, that's a, it's a whole it's a whole different thing. Uh, it's it's an ethical thing. I don't yeah. Anyway, um, part of how I voted and how I vote typically is actually uh, based on the theory of virtue ethics, which is that a virtuous person does virtuous things. Um, and so my voting is based on the best idea I can get about who the people are. Um, so in the past election, didn't vote for either major party because I don't think either of those people are virtuous people. Um, and so if I don't think you are a virtuous, pe- virtuous person, I don't think you'll do virtuous things. Um, and I think that's clear from both presidents. So um, the past president and the current president, that we are not necessarily doing virtuous things um, and in different ways. So typically Republicans have a stronger bent toward being anti-immigration. Um, and typically Democrats have a stronger bent being toward uh on the pro-choice side of things. Um, And so there is a different way in which both parties are non-virtuous a lot of times, even in their own platforms. So having a refugee count that is lower than much smaller countries than ours is a non-virtuous action um, because we are supposed to be a place that welcomes refugees. And then as Christians, we're supposed to welcome foreigners uh, in and be kind to the orphans and the widows and the poor. Um, And then on the other side, Every life is created in the image of God, and so we should be concerned that people are dying. And so for me, um, in the last election, I was like, neither of these people. So I did research on the other people who were running and was like, I don't really agree with this person's politics all the way, but I think this person's the most virtuous person I could find who is actually running. Um, And so in theory, I guess my vote didn't count. Um, (laughs) But (laughs) but I'm in California, and we have an electoral college, so my vote for president didn't really count You didn't think it counted for Uh, a (laughs) while. Well, then that's one of the, the 
ongoing conversations is that when you have primarily two parties, yep, you you're going to you're getting a grab bag of of things. And some of them you're going to like yep. and some of them you're not going to like. Um, if there are more parties that give us more options that were were more legitimate, then then the idea would be, well, that that, that would be great because then we can customize our candidates more. But then you end up in a situation like what Israel's going through, where they've got like twenty four parties. They've had five elections, can't figure out president, have no expectation of being able to figure out a president. So the only thing you can do is make a coalition government, which means that if at some point one of those pieces of the coalition decides no, that we're not going to do that, you're back to elections. And then, I mean, I don't know how much money. Um, we spend per election in America, but I know it's in the many billions of dollars. So just imagine doing three a year or like right. five in two years. Like, yeah. we had, like what are we doing? Well, I think is why I tend to, because people like to say you vote for the platform, not the person. And that may have been true at a certain time, um, but I don't think that is true now. Uh, if it was, then they could put up, we wouldn't have primaries because um, the platform right. the people would spit relevant. out a person yeah. and that person would kind of be like the robot politician dude from parks and rec who just like sits and smiles and then gives speeches um and then they would just do the politics stuff on the side and then we would be able to objectively be like these against these which do you vote for um but i don't think that's actually what's happening in american politics uh because we like to have these leaders who are who are these big deals uh and so typically i think this is probably true for most of americans presidents uh it is we actually vote for the person. And so that's why we should try yeah. to vote for virtuous people. Um, and so if the person you voted for felt you felt was virtuous, then good on you. Uh, <laughs> that would be, that would be my stance yeah. on how you should vote. Um, not necessarily for a po- specific party, but for a certain type of virtues that line up with scripture. Um, do we have more to say about politics? Probably, but not helpful. <laughs> Are there arguments to be had? <laughs> Huh? It's politics. It's always there's arguing. always an argument. We have like twelve opinions right here in this room. Yeah, just the three of us. All right. Well, that's politics for you. You probably disagree. The email you address probably disagree <laughs> is podcast at parksidevisalia dot org. My personal email is Jeremiah at parksidevisalia dot org. Um, or just email office at parksidevisalia dot org. Email them. <laughs> email somebody parksidevisalia dot org. Guess a name. Throw it in there. Um, and that'll be good. Uh, we're gonna take a break. We'll do one more of these. We're spinning the wheel. We're back. Uh, it's oh, ah, a little spazzy. little spazzy. Oh, we got Bible translations. I think we've talked there about this, go. but uh, no. in passing, we talked about it with inerrancy. In passing. Yeah. Um, so this shouldn't be take that long. Um, use the Bible translation that makes sense to you uh, is my stance on Bible translations, because intelligibility, uh, you, have to, you have to be able to understand. What's your preferred Bible. reading translation? My preferred one is the CSB. Uh, they redid it recently. CSB. CSB, Christian Standard Bible. They redid it and sound like CSV. It. I'm like, what? CSV. I made up my own. Um, <laughs> that's, a spe- that's a spreadsheet? Would, <laughs> yeah. So I, <laughs> I think um, the main thing with Bible translations is to get one that you understand and that you can read a paraphrase as a help, but it shouldn't be your primary translation. Um so have a Bible that has the whole Bible there. And then if you want to read the message on the side, great. That's fine. It helps you paraphrase things. Um, but it's not, it shouldn't be your prime. I don't think Eugene Peterson meant for it to be your primary no. reading Bible. So, um, and, and he was a good exegete, so he might get some stuff wrong, but. And read Eugene Peterson besides the master's translation. He's got really good stuff. Yeah. yeah. So don't, don't let that zero. It, you mean. But that's what I would say is you should read something that you can actually read. Uh, and that has the whole thing there. Um, you want to stay away from, um, the Jehovah's Witness one, because uh, they don't believe Jesus is God, and they took stuff out of it, and they have anonymous translators, uh, and anonymous translators are liars. So, uh, <laughs> and I think it's important to remember with Bible translations that it's on some levels interpreting you're interpreting it into a different language. Yeah. So right. there is some sometimes they try their best. That's why you do multiple people translating, but there are sometimes agendas. In a Bible translation. Right. So I like the CSB, uh, Christian Standard Bible. It used to be the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Uh, they recently updated it. Um, I know a lot of people who actually worked on it. Uh, and I think they did a really good job of a mix between a higher reading level. So I think it's a little bit higher of a reading level than like the ESG. But it's not difficult in very many places where I think... Um, probably before I was like ESV, NASB, somewhere in between there. And I think it hits right in between. And so it's helpful because sometimes the NASB is sometimes is a little bit wooden and is useful, but also... But I why, do you, why do academics prefer NASB? 
because it, it it has to do with translation theory. So the way you translate is one of two, one of three ways, really. Word to word translation, um, and then like try uh, to read young slow equivalence, which is what the CSB goes for, is like an equivalence. Like what is the mo- what are the what is the author saying, and then how would we actually say it in English? Because when you learn languages, uh, at first you learn word to word translation, and so. Um, you are translating things, and then if you put them in English, it's like that doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. And so they're taking it. If you want to try that, read Young's literal translation. <laughs> <laughs> don't <laughs> just don't. Not always. You helpful. don't need to. And then yeah. there's the the paraphrase <laughs> idea, which is like I take everything it's saying and then boil that down into my own thoughts about it. Uh, is kind of how that works. So like if I was going to say this, how I would say it. Whereas the CSB is more going for we translate all the words and then we make sure they make sense in modern English. Um, where like if you read the KJV work of art great literary work but some of it if you read it now there are uh things that were translated into words we use now that don't mean what they meant in 1611 that's right and so <laughs> so you end up with a weird you're like i don't know and then you end up preaching or teaching or understanding the bible incorrectly because you understood the translation wrong and it's not your fault uh <laughs> and it's, yeah and now it's you're, not their fault they, that's yeah, they were in 1611 <laughs> So there you go. Yeah. I really like the Net Bible, N-E-T, New English Translation. By the way, we should stop using new in translations because not new they either. get old. <laughs> <laughs> and most of them aren't new. <laughs> They're mostly revised. But the, I like the Net because when you read through it on an electronic device, they have little numbers above them that it gives you the footnotes on it and why they made a word choice. Right. And a lot of translations will do that a little bit, but Net has like 1,100 of these little things that you can see different footnotes on why they chose this over that and s- some study things there as well. And part of what I like about the NASB, um, it, it, it is a wooden, obviously like it's, but what I'm, what I have the confidence in is that it's using in the translation, some correlation to the, to the exact words that were in the original, at least that's our concept of it. So sometimes I'm leery of, uh, paraphrases or other translations that are trying to help us understand it too much, that they're using too much license with language so that it, it makes me wonder, okay, is this actual word or is are these concepts a part of what were in the original that this might be leading me into a way of thinking as opposed to just seeing, um, and that, I guess reliability for me is the issue. So I use the NASB for a study hmm. uh, for preaching. Um, but when it comes to just reading, um, like for uh, chapels or things like that, high schoolers, uh, middle schoolers, um, I like the I like the NAV, and I'm, I have the benefit of having a 1984. Not very many of them around, so the 1984 you was a sell it. NFTs. You should sell pictures of it. <laughs> <laughs> so it it was one of the very reliable, um, thought for thought kind of translations that we had a few iterations that weren't as great, but um, so I, I think it's it's really serviceable for that age um i would hesitate rounding the edges off of the woodenness too far to the point where now in order just to get smooth reading and and for us to make sense of the language we might actually lose the yeah message. i think that's why you go with uh if you're going with a thought for thought thing you go with like an older niv or esv or csb is because the reading level it is written at is it, there are there are benefits to a lower reading level if you have a lower reading level or if you are reading it to someone who doesn't understand scripture. Yeah. Um, but if you are a person who has a normal like high school reading level, I think that's most people's average topping off point is high school uh, for a reading level. Um, you should be reading a Bible that it is like actually there rather yeah. than let's read something that's super simple. And I think that's usually the the goal of some of the Bibles, and they should have that goal because there's some people who don't have a high reading level. Um, but the, yeah, the other thing about translations is they sometimes divide things weirdly that not isn't necessary in the Greek and Hebrew that they for readability they make sections that aren't necessarily in yeah, the yeah, thing. Yeah. And using multiple translations. And that was time, my next point yeah, was like there's there's no reason to read one and none of the other ones because there's enough nuance in translation yep. that one committee will and read. And that's one the day. benefit of being around now is that like at one yeah. point the Bible you had was the Bible you had and <laughs> if you don't understand that one, sorry. <laughs> tough luck you know um which is why the king james version is the work of art that it is is because it was able to by the 1700s be widely distributed uh and widely understood by uh, the whole english-speaking world like that that's a pretty big deal um where now like 
if you ask a hundred people, you're you're going to get a bunch of different answers of what Bible they prefer, um, and I think that that is fine. Um, but at the same time, uh, it is we we sometimes like when we come to church, probably use whatever Bible in church. You have your phone, you can just switch to the version your pastor is using. Then you won't get lost. I have this happen with youth all the time. I tell them a lot of times where what Bible I'm using, and then they still get lost. Like, what verse are you in? And I'm like, I told you where I was in. And what NA twenty nine? Yeah, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> that would be the Greek translation um, of the New Testament. Yeah, so that's Bible translations. Yeah, I don't have anything else about Bible translations. And if you see differences, if you're reading a word for word, and the ESP and the NIV and the NSP all have different, it's really fun to go study why that is and. Look yeah. at the Greek there. A little and you bit. can find a lot of the people who were on those translation committees, like on the NIV translation committee, you have people like Doug Moo. Uh, I don't really know anybody on the NESB one. Uh, the CSB one had people like uh, Tom Schreiner and Michael Rodelnik. Uh, and I know there's another guy at Southern who was on that committee. Um, but you can they have written commentaries on these books as well. So um, their translation is informed by like a lifetime of study of these texts in the original languages. It's not like we just find random people and say, yeah. good luck. It's Tell right. us what the Bible says. Uh, <laughs> and so um, they're typically, most of them are not trying to deceive you um, unless you're reading a Bible. That's a cult Bible. Um, <laughs> and, the- <laughs> and look, look at those. Like if, if a Bible is being written to a certain group for a certain group by a certain group, probably it's skewed to their, their agenda a little bit. and so you're gonna they're using it to validate their peculiarities and i it's not helpful All to right. do that are you ready i'm ready one more because that one was easy here we go oh, smooth as silk huh? Huh? Uh, oh diet and exercise diet and exercise. um what should christians think about diet and exercise what should we do mm. how should we live <laughs> colossians <laughs> um this week uh, and one of the things that happens in the Colossian church is that there are people who, uh, there are two different types of people who are trying to deceive the Colossians. There's a type of people who say that angels came and spoke to them and gave them special knowledge. And then there's another type of people that are trying to impose Judaism upon uh, the Colossian church. And so they, uh, Paul there quotes them saying like, um, you you allow people to tell you, do not taste, do not touch, uh, all these things. And they make you follow Sabbaths and they make you follow certain festivals and certain feasts. Um, and if anyone tries to do that to Paul, he always tells them no. Um, there are times where he is everything to every person, but whenever you tell him he has to do something, he's like, no, nah, I'm not doing it. Uh, <laughs> so, contrarian, Paul. Uh, <laughs> he's willing to give to other people, but he's not going to let them tell him. Right. So when the people are like, you have to be circumcised if you're a Gentile, he says, no, we don't have to do that. Um, but then he circumcises Timothy in order to get him into uh, um, Jewish culture. into the synagogues. Right. So uh, I think that is in play when we talk about diet and exercise is that if someone tells you you have to do a specific thing or eat specific foods or not eat specific foods uh, because you are a Christian, um, that person, according to Paul, is preaching a different gospel. Um, and so that seems like harsh language when we're talking about diets. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, if someone's like, you can't have pork or you can't have uh, that, whatever it is. That was Peter's whole issue. Right. So Peter in Acts 10 deals with this where Jesus tells him to eat from a sheet full of unclean animals. And uh, Peter's like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. And Jesus is like, I mean, I'm, I am Jesus. Uh, that's the rundown for you. That's the synopsis. He's <laughs> like, right. hey, wh- who are you? Uh, <laughs> it's Peter's like Job moment number 55 where Peter has to realize, oh, I'm not God. All right. right. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna let you it's make most of rules. Peter's experience. It's like, dang it. <laughs> I thought I had it figured out. Um, and so, yeah, so that's on diet, on exercise. I think um, where I would go with this typically is that our bodies are temples. And so because of that, we should be, if we are eating and drinking to the glory of God and taking care of our body to the glory of God, uh, at some level, we should be trying to take care of our bodies. Now, there are um, all sorts of reasons that diet and exercise might not work for a person. There are chemical reasons. There are genetic reasons. There are sickness reasons, like all of those things. Right. Um, and so I think it is an individual thing. Laziness, is that a good There's also a laziness part, which I think sometimes we excuse laziness based on the other ones. <laughs> because I think uh, gluttony is probably the most tolerated sin in the American church. Um, we're fine with 
however much you want to eat. And especially in like men's ministries, it's more like you should eat as until you feel sick. That's right. Uh, we know if the Bible says don't do this, while you're driving. <laughs> but we're going to want you to. We're going to need <laughs> you to eat more. Um, and so I think that is where we sometimes fall into error on this is that we sometimes overindulge and according to scripture, overindulging probably isn't glorifying to God. Um, and so when we eat and drink yeah. to the glory of God, overindulging ourselves probably is not that. Um, yeah. So I think that's where I would, I would go with that, but then it's not a, it's an individual thing. So, yeah. uh, how much exercise I do, um, isn't, doesn't make me more Christian or less Christian. Uh, it is a, am I bringing glory to God with the way I am treating the body he gave me? It's very similar to the way we use money, um, that God gave me this body. And so I should be taking care of it. Uh, uh, and if I'm not, then, then that's an issue I need to deal with. Um, yeah, I think it can go the other way too, though, where our diet and exercise can become an idol. That's what that I was going to Gets say. in the way no. of us I was going to do that God. extreme because that's yeah. what my body is. <laughs> yeah, it's all idolatry right there. Five miles <laughs> every day. I don't like running. <laughs> Who does? Um, I don't think runners like running. That's why I, I played hockey. It's but Stockholm Syndrome. It's Stock- running. <laughs> they've been, <laughs> they've been, they've been cap- taken captive and they the think society. it's good. That's right. Well, it's, it's connected to... They tell me that it's connected to endorphins, the endorphins, man. right? Yeah. So you you, you, ha- you have all of these things that make you feel good. So then the more that you do them, the more you feel good about them. And then I was going to get like, but on the other end of that is that you can be chasing that feeling, chasing that rush so that you live to exercise, you live to diet. It's kind of, it, it can be the same with anything that you, all of a sudden you're gearing your whole life around this one thing and it's energizing, whether like, we talk about money, like it's energizing to save money. Well, now are you, exclusively going to save money when there's a person in front of you that needs help. Well, right. Cause now, there's like, now your ethics have to play yeah, into it. Again. There's a, there's a, it is a good thing probably to take care of your body. The people who are in shape are probably following the commands to take care of ourselves better than mm-hmm. other people. But then on the other hand, sometimes it leads you to not enjoy the things that God has put into the world for you to enjoy. Yeah. Because it, within, uh, even if you go look at the Levitical law, all the things that they're going to have in the promised land are put there so that they can enjoy them, so that they can have feasts, so that they can have fellowship together. And I think that is part that is missed on the one side. Um, and I think either way, we're chasing kind of a high. Um, also, it's it could be, and it's not everybody who exercises, but I'm exercising, so people give me compliments, and my self worth right. is and tied becomes, up in my uh, body image. Right, yeah. and it becomes a modesty issue. That that's what modesty in scripture means is that you do something so other people will look at you and be like, "Wow, you're really impressive." Um, and that when Paul says to be that's modest, why I bench five hundred pounds. Yeah, all the time, <laughs> exactly. constantly, all these goals. every day. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think that's probably the two sides and that, but but like, like anything else, it can be a a discipline though, too. Like if you, you know, we talked in James about how the tongue is a revealer of the heart. Well, I think if we are overindulging and and it's very easy to use it external, use external metrics. Like if, when I was in my twenties, I ate my 46 year old self like two to one. And that's pretty impressive. But it would have made no difference. I looked exactly the same day in, day out. And so to look at the externals of it and say, well, okay, this isn't a person that's struggling with gluttony or he's not struggling or she's not struggling with overeating or overindulging just because of their outward appearance. Right. That's not a very good way to look at right. it. So from a spiritual discipline standpoint, we have to be sensitive uh, of those times where um, where our indulgence is is the Holy Spirit saying, look how fleshly you are not because of your eating but because of your lack of self-control and that's one right. of the evidence of the holy spirit is self-control so diet and exercise become one of those things that also is an indicator of um of our spiritual discipline in being obedient to what god's asking right. us to do so i think that's one of the places where it's really difficult um mostly because uh probably something that you should be checking on yourself or with another person that you feel really close to, you shouldn't be going up to random people and telling them how much they should or should not eat or how much they need to exercise. Right. Um, unless you know that person really well, it's not uh, It's not going to come off as loving. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's going to come off as lovely. you being like, hey, you know, you really shouldn't eat this much. You really need to cut back, which is really, it comes off as you saying, hey, you know you're fat, right? Like, <laughs> It is appearance, yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody knows. And then, 
uh, that doesn't make anyone feel good about themselves. It doesn't encourage people. It doesn't, no, that's, it's, it's, that's not going to move them forward right. into any place. of Right. If you want to come alongside like, someone, and there's a guy I follow on Twitter who is a pastor, and uh, basically his dad had a heart attack, and he started working out because of that, and then now like puts on Twitter like, hey, if you want help losing weight, I lost this much weight on this plan that has been able to be sustained. Um, Perry Noble? No, not Perry Noble. <laughs> He did that. I oh, okay. Uh, I think his name is BJ Thompson. I think that's right. I could be wrong. Um, but, and so he's, he tells people basically, because it's, I'm using my time to help you and I'm becoming like a personal trainer, if you could like, it, he, it, he charges a certain amount of money, but it's not a lot. Um, but he's not going and finding people on Twitter and being like, hey, you're real fat. Do you want, do you you want help <laughs> losing weight? Because that'd be weird. Instead, he's saying, hey, if you already know you need help, but you're like stuck in a, in laziness or in uh, gluttony or any yep. of these things, then I will help you and I'll walk alongside you because sometimes we get caught in those places and do not have the spiritual community around us to say, I will help you if you need help. Mm-hmm. Um, or we don't feel uh, okay c- confessing the fact that we have a issue with self-control when it comes to eating. Like that is a hard thing to say. Um, and typically we don't have the community around us to say it. Um, most of us have trigger foods that we have yeah. very hard self-control of. Ice cream. Yeah. I love ice cream. I could eat three gallons of ice cream right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have spicy chicken sandwiches are my Ooh, nemesis. Chips. Uh, yeah, yeah, chips too. I have Actually, so I don't have anything that's not. Unless it has raisins in it, I, I'll eat whatever. Yeah. A cookie should not have raisins in it. Uh, they're good though. Nothing no. should have raisins. Raisins are good. Sp- especially raisins and uh, chicken salad? With celery? Hey. Celery. Sometimes it's vegetables. You know? Um Sometimes I'm like, it's I could the eat, most useless. I could eat this whole is. extra large bag of baby carrots right now, and then I do. Uh, that's what, no that's ranch. What it, that's what just it, straight that's up. That's what Evan does. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, hey, heads of broccoli. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> My wife would say, "That's your body crying out for vitamins." Like, it probably is. It's probably like a breaking threshold. Oh, iceberg lettuce, whole head of it. Boom, one sitting. Um, but those are no calories. Iceberg. I know. Isn't that weird? <laughs> um, Whole stock of celery, boom. Negative, ca- negative calories. Peanut butter on it? Category. No, no peanut butter. Just straight celery. I mean, don't and all peanut butter stringy with that. goodness. Mm. My kids do that. Celery. celery. So good. Anyway, uh, that's diet and exercise. Ecumenicism. Should we work with other churches or not? Two layers of ecumenicism. Interchurch, shared ministry for shared vision, shared whatever. Um, higher ecumenism is broadly connecting with interfaith relation interfaith communities to resolve certain issues i think those are the two issues that play with ecumenicism or ecumenical i would i would put a third one in between third of denominations working together that's not interfaith uh but sometimes people get really into the denomination and they're like i will not do anything with any southern baptists or i will not do anything with any ev free people i don't know why you have a problem with ev free people which is why i mentioned them um some people do though you know you're like i'm not gonna Uh, and usually it has to do with you had a bad experience with somebody because if we're saying that denominational things are second tier then we believe all those people are in the kingdom of god uh and so we should be able to get past ourselves that way in theory should be able to work together uh if we believe we're all christians and i would i would agree i don't think i don't think any of us would say that we shouldn't work with other churches with other um especially with large-scale things like city evangelism like yeah. if our city got saved in a day there's about a hundred thousand people or a little more than that in Vesselia, we none of our churches, churches yeah. could hold yeah. even a quarter of that and if you think that this should be all for you then you have that greed problem right and also even that like if everyone in Visalia got saved in a day, even all the churches we presently have might not be able to hold everybody. No, like, <laughs> for sure. Like, there's a, a certain number of churches, and each of those churches is a certain size. So even if we were like, all right, let's start with the smaller churches, fill those up, and then we went up, like, everywhere's no going to be full, and yeah. we're going to have no to have chance. extra services holding. Yeah. So yeah, so I think denominationally, obviously, we should be able to work together. Usually yeah. we can't. Usually it's a pride thing. Um, it is not usually because we actually disagree so strongly with someone that we should be breaking fellowship with them. It usually has to do with either a personal thing with someone in that church or because we think those people are idiots. And so why would we ever trust them? With the or that we've moved stuff into bigger tier yeah. issues, like we've moved worship styles like yep, right. into a bigger thing or... Any number of things. Yeah. 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 So then the other, the other layer of that would be interfaith... Um, and there, there, there's always that, that area where there is commonality in certain issues. Um, I would say that pretty much anybody, one that believes in God would hold to the value 
of human life. So not throwing the atheists under the bus in the sense that I don't believe in the value of human life, but if we're looking at how humanity came into existence and a world religion attributes that to the work of a God, then in theory, we can come together on issues of abortion and say, we should not ever do this ever yeah. again and, and have good, good reasons for why we would do or that. Or peacekeeping. Right. Yeah, yeah. I would even go, yeah. there's the a two episodes ago on the Holy efforts. Post podcast, they interviewed a guy who is a pastor who is doing work with um, Muslim and Jewish people on religious liberty in other parts of the world. Um, and that all of the people, like we should, basically his argument is like, everyone should have a problem with the Muslims in um, in Myanmar being yeah. killed by Hindu people. Like we shouldn't be okay with that. Yeah. And so if we have, if we were working with the Muslim people to get them religious liberty, in Myanmar, then what we can do is in that show them who Jesus is. And so it allows our, he would, he argues that it actually makes our strength stronger. Um, and that the reason we have so many people leaving the church when they become adults is because they haven't ever seen anyone of any other faith, um, or been able to interact with them. And so because of that, we, when you get into the real world and you have to deal with the fact that people believe different things, um, it throws you off and yeah. you're like, Oh no, what am I going to do? And so you just leave the church altogether right. rather than realizing like we can, we can agree on certain things. It's what Paul does in um, acts 17, I think, right. right. Uh, the Areopagus yeah. where he's like, you guys agree with all of this. You're right on all of these points. And here's where you're wrong. Um, and we don't start with the, here's where you're wrong. We uh, start with like, we can we can work together on human life. We can work together on religious liberties. We can work together on getting refugees here. We can work together on all sorts of things. Making um, sure people are fed and yeah. have water. We yeah. can we can yeah. feed people together, and then that allows us. Uh, in all of his experiences, basically, he's like that allows me to share the gospel, because now I'm not uh, someone who's closed off to conversation, yeah. and someone who seems like they don't actually agree with what Jesus teaches. Yeah, and and I wouldn't say that there is any need to back away from our faith positions yeah. to do that stuff, which right. is usually the pressure of the yep. ecumenical uh, detractors as well. You're, you're losing your identity in order to work with, with others. And, and I, I just don't know how that's necessarily the case that right. we, we have to like, we have pressure in all po facets of society to not talk about Jesus. Why would it, why would it preclude us from being helpful when we can be helpful. Yeah. Uh, but if that were to be the case, if it would be a situation where like you have to leave your faith at the door and you know, the only way to be a part of what we're doing is to, is to accept our faith as valid and as, uh, as fulfilling and satisfying. And well, you know, th then it's, then they've created an arbitrary line that I'm not going to cross with them, but I don't know why that we need to create that. Barrier. Right. Yeah. And I think it's a really good interview. I cannot remember the dude's name. Um, at all. I don't know why. Because one of the things he says is that that is actually the part that he thinks people get wrong, is that oftentimes we think, well, if I'm going to go talk to Muslim and Hindu people and build common ground or points of contact, that I have to pretend I'm not a Christian yeah. and then spring it on them uh, <laughs> <laughs> and surprise them with surprise. Jesus. And he's like, that's not it at all. Like He goes to meetings and they have someone pray at the meeting, so he prays in Jesus' name. Uh, because yeah. when he prays in Jesus name, he is letting them know I am a Christian and I'm not worried about you knowing I'm a Christian. And he had one guy tell him that lets me know that I can talk to you about me being a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not that religion is now off the table yeah. for us to have a, a conversation that right. isn't hostile. And, and, and it's kind of deceptive to engage in all of these endeavors without our faith being front and, and center, because then, like you said, at some point down the road, whether it's with our neighbor or it's a person we're working at the food bank or it's a person that we're helping with water bottles at a marathon, like at some point or other, we're going to, our faith is supposed to come out. And then all of a sudden we're, what, two or three years into this relationship. And it's like, oh, I didn't even know you were Christian this whole time. Like, and that shouldn't, that shouldn't that's not good. <laughs> that's not what we're going for. No. Uh, and there was a while where I feel like evangelism was going I think early 2000s, that was yep. the push. Is like, that we'll, the, we'll sneak in places and we'll get there. And then eventually you'll tell them. Um, and that isn't what Jesus does. Like mm -hmm. Jesus shows up and is like, the kingdom of God is here, but also show the people that the kingdom of God is here. You do both. Um, so you you speak the truth in love and you put that together. Right. You don't just come out and be like, you're all idiots and you can't do anything right. Mm -hmm. And you also don't pretend that you don't believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so there yeah. we go. Ecumenicism. Um that's all for today. That's it. We did it. Um, if you have comments, a wrap. questions, concerns, disagreements, especially on that first one, podcast at parksidevisalia.org is the email. 
um, and I will be looking forward to it. Maybe next one will just be email responses. Send all the emails, uh, rate, subscribe, review. I've not said that so many times that I don't even remember. Just uh, five stars are the only ones that count. 